Hi, this is Valerie Bates. I'm the marketing director for the city of Port Isabel. And um, we have a very special guest today with me. I have to turn on the flashers because somebody's pulling up behind us, Bobby. Okay. You want to introduce yourself and... Well, I'm Bobby Wells, and she decided to take me for a ride and let me show her what Port Isabel used to look like. And, um, you know, we, we don't have a, um, an agenda. It'll become obvious here pretty soon. But the idea is to um, take a look around our town and talk about your history here. So we're right across the street from Queen Isabel Inn, which was built 1905-1906. Yes, ma'am, and this is where I had my junior senior prom in this hotel. I thought I was really uptown to go in this hotel for a special occasion. Well, it, it is uptown. <laughs> About as much town as we've ever had, right? So, um, Bobby, <clears throat> You were how old when you arrived here in Port Isabel? I got here when I was seven years old. I got here in 1930. So like we talked the about the other day, um, well, that's, that's some pretty incredible math. Um, <laughs> like we talked the other day, um, lots of changes were happening in Port Isabel in 1930. It was a, uh, a baby town. Had just been incorporated in 28 and... Definitely, definitely, and it was being promoted by quite a few of the people that were trying to get people to come from north down here to spend money and promote this little town. Right. So it was, it was going to get pretty active. It didn't get really active till probably 34 when Dr. Hockaday started TIFT, Texas International Fishing Tournament. At that time it was actually called Tarpon Rodeo. So for a seven-year-old little girl, what was it like um, arriving here in Port Isabel? Well, I came from Rochester, Minnesota, where we had sidewalks. We did not have <laughs> sidewalks in Port Isabel. We had nothing but dirt streets. We had one main street that was concrete, but otherwise you, you were cutting across the field or you were just walking in a dirt street. So. I uh, need to ask you, how did your family um, end up in Port Isabel? Well, as I said, we were in Rochester, Minnesota in the Depression, and it was very expensive in the Depression to live in the North, so we, my father said, we have to go South. We ended up in Brownsville, and my father found out there was a little bit further we could go South, so we came to Port Isabel, and we got so broke we couldn't leave town, so we're still here. <laughs> so you mentioned that it was a bit of a camping trip for you on the way down. My father was a fisherman at that time on the lakes of Minnesota. We went somewhere all the time to fish and, and uh, you know, just picnic. And we had a lot of camping equipment, so we loaded all that up, and we camped out all the way from Minnesota to Texas. What time of the year was that? Do you happen to remember? Did you leave Minnesota in the winter or was you it? You know, we got here in September, so we oh, probably okay. left in the summertime. Yeah, we probably, it probably took us a while to get down here because I have an idea Dad was looking for something along the way, but we never, uh, we never stayed anywhere ever. And what did your dad do as a tradesman? He was a mechanic. He was an uh, automobile mechanic. He worked for the um, the Mayo brothers, taking care of their automobiles while we were in Rochester. And he just figured that, you know, there's a lot of cars that are not on the road anymore. Things are getting kind of tight that way with the Depression. So he just thought we'd be cheaper to leave down south. Oh. Uh, better move south. Well, Port Isabel is lucky to have you here, Bobby. Well, thank you. You know, I do love it. Port Isabel, I love Port Isabel, but I have been so blessed that my two boys have never left me. They're still here in Port Isabel. Right. They married Yankee girls, but I guess he put it <laughs> across to them that they wanted my boys. They had to learn to live in Port Isabel, which I am very proud of both of them. 
You know, we find people that watch these uh, videos, they may not be from here in town, but they have this deep connection to Port Isabel. There, there's something about this town, even if you weren't born here or, you know, it just, it just grabs you. But um, so we talked the other day about uh, one of your first experiences here, getting here in 1933, and you stayed um, pretty close to this area we're at right now, didn't you? That's right. We were right on the bay. We thought, you know, there was an open beach even at that time, and that's where we camped out till we found a place to, to move in. Dad found a job as a mechanic in a mechanic shop, and we kind of lived in the storeroom behind him while we looked around for something that we could live in while we were here. <coughs> Other so, than the tents, we were living in tents at that time. I, I know that happened quite a few places across Texas. That <coughs> um, that's how people started to homestead. You used what you had. Right. Um, so what happened in 1933? Well, we had that hurricane that wiped us out big time. Let me tell you, big time. We were. In my little, we were in a little cottage at the time it happened, and we moved into the post office. And we were in the downstairs, it's a two story building, and we were downstairs in the post office. And the water was, I was, at that time I was 10 years old, the water was up to my chest in and, the building. And your dad was out in a boat when the storm? The, my dad was in a boat when the storm was reported by the Coast Guards for him to bring that boat and tie it up and head for home because we had no connection whatsoever with weather reports. No radios, no contact, only through the Coast Guards. And the Coast Guards were on the island. They could only come to us by coming in a boat to get to us, to give us the word. We had no communication at all. So when, when, the, uh, <coughs> when the clouds parted and you thought the storm was passed, you stepped out, took a look around? We didn't know about storms, and we certainly didn't know about the lull. And when the wind quit blowing, we thought, oh, hallelujah. So we opened up and went out and took a look to be sure everything was okay, which it wasn't by any means. But then it turned around and came back and put us right back in that building for another little while. So it was, it was, it was, it was terrifying. Absolutely I terrifying. can imagine. It did wipe out Port Isabel big time. So what was the housing situation? Housing situation was terrible. Terrible. There was nothing available. Most of the people that owned their homes were in their homes, but us that were living in other people's property, and they were gone. There were a lot of there, there were very few houses built sound enough to go through the 33 hurricane. So it was like uh, two steps forward and one back. You got that right. Because we lost everything. We didn't have a thing left after the hurricane. So we've got a, a, a picture here. Um, of um, a house you said your dad found. Um, that you all could move into. Right. It looks like there. It looks like some work's going on. I can see a ladder up against the back of it. And... Um, so you all had to make some improvements to the house. We did, and this is what we did. We, my father covered it with tar paper to make it more weatherproof, and I called it the black house. I thought it was pretty cute when I was 10 years old. I guess I was 12 when this picture was taken. Yeah, because uh, some shrubbery grew up uh -huh, a little bit around right, the house. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, we, we improved it quite a You notice the roof looks pretty good. That yeah, was the main thing. Yeah. But it's a single board house, and when back when it was before we redid it, you can tell that we had to cover it with something to keep the weather out. Right. That That's was, a miracle that thing stood you, to the storm. You got it right. You got it right. And your rent was $8 a month? Our rent was $8 a month, and sometimes we got a little bit behind. Who had $8 a month in those days? And you lived there from 33 till... Uh, Probably 37, when I was in the seventh grade, we moved to something a lot nicer. You know this had no plumbing, not even in the kitchen. So you were, you were uh, one of the families that uh, watched for the Aguadores to come around with the fresh water. Oh yeah, big time. Um, and the bicycle that you're on, 
uh, you mentioned something about that. Well, I said I never had a bicycle, so if this picture I must have borrowed somebody's because in my whole life I never had a bicycle wow. of my own. But we shared everything we had. Everybody in town was of the same economical situation. Right. I mean, we were all broke. We were all broke and we were all happy and we were all close, close and took care of each other. It was a very tight little town. There was no upper class, lower class, nothing like that. We were just all one. I think there's a lot of that same spirit still here, which is why Port Isabel so. is so connected to its Definitely. people. Yeah. And the location of that house um, you mentioned was um, near the uh, First, National. First National Bank. Right. It was right across from CPNL. CPNL was on the right oh, okay. side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, that was almost, that was downtown. You got it, yeah. See, yeah. you could look out your uh, window and see the lighthouse. Oh, yeah. But in those days, you know, we didn't have any animal control laws, so we had a lot of animals. We had a lot of horses, donkeys. That just made themselves at home. a lot of chickens. And, Pigs. You know, nobody, and cows. We had cows. We yeah. had a lot of people that had their own milk cow were right here in Port Isabel. So you got fresh milk? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I bought milk from Dr. Hockaday. He had a cow. And wow. He put his milk on my doorstep when I, later on when I got married and had children and he was here. He had a cow back in those days and that's in the 40s. That's Bob was born in 46. So, you know, Dr. Hockaday was right across the How street. How about that? And he had a cow and I don't know if his, he had, you know, two sets of, of boys and I don't know that Richard and Billy or Richard and uh, I can't think of the other one's name one of them was Robert Robert yeah yeah I'm sure they had to milk it right I'm sure right I'm a sure part of part had. of their chores yeah now yeah. one of the reasons why we chose Garcia Street to go down is because um, this was like the main street in town wasn't it it was. It's where everything happened. This is where Bayview tourist courts were. It was a city block all the way around with cottages. There was one right next to it called Seabreeze Cafe. I mean Seabreeze Cottages. And uh, it, uh, it, was, it was pretty popular. And it was right down here where we are now in this section that uh, we had our tents set up when we first came So here. this is on uh, East Washington on. and North Garcia Streets mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to just give folks a, an idea where we're at exactly. And um, and then at some point in time, uh, Doc Hockaday built his offices up here. Right there where um, that wall is. So I'm going to swing you all around to see that. And right over here was the Bayview Church Cottages. So that's going to be to our left here. So we're at the we're at the corner of, of Adams and um, and Garcia Street. And those bricks, Dr. Hockaday built those bricks. He was in the brick business at that time that he did that wall with. We could do yeah, Hockaday we because we could. Yeah. he was involved in a lot of things. So at some point in time, uh, early 50s on up to 54 and they're putting in a bridge here and then Garcia Street became even more uh, populated. Right, right. More businesses were on this street at one time than there is now. <clears throat> a lot of cafes and, and bakeries and just, just a lot of little individual mom and pop operations. Somewhat alike, a, a lot like it is today. Um, that's that's why we have a lot of these businesses here. They go way back to that time. And right to the left of you was where Marchands had their marina. Uh, marina and restaurant right. and um, Wilcox had the marina and Marchands had the restaurant. It was very, very popular. Everybody came here from all over the valley to eat seafood. The best seafood restaurant ever. Uh, yeah, people still talk about that and still oh, yeah. um, 
um, ask about it. Right. So while we're uh, while we're here in this area, let's talk about the um, the boat pictures that you had here. Well, it's called a barge, and this is where my father used to spend. I used to spend my summers with him because he was on a barge as a fisherman. These are the nets hanging up here that he would put out when he would call it bird striking. And uh, he would put the nets down and catch the fish and bring them back up. I think we have two pictures of that. What happened is we worked for Bernie Burnell and he would uh, bring us out in a market boat and drop us off. And then they'd come back at the end of the day and gather up my father's fish and take them to market. And if my father needed to go back into town, he would catch a ride with a market boat and get the supplies and stuff and come back. But it was quite a rare experience. I don't think any of the young people have a clue of what fun I had growing <laughs> up doing all these crazy things. So it's like your little island out there. Yeah, and all of this water, we had a nice skiff tied up behind the barge. And I had a pair of oars, and I just rode all over that bay. I thought that was what you're supposed to do. How, long, how far offshore was that? We were probably not too far off of Laguna Vista, but that's where most of the fish houses were at that time, was over on North Shore. I know Weichel's Corner used oh, okay. to be Laguna Vista. Entrance was called Weichel's Corner at one time because Weichel had a nice pier out there. So you would just go straight off of North Shore and go out into the bay and Mother would come out and spend quite a few evenings with us or nice with us and but Mother was kind of taking care of the home front but we um, we kids thought it was great. I would take my friends, I would take uh, the Williams daughter or the carpenter daughter. We'd all go out there and spend the night and sleep up here on the roof if we wanted to. We just thought, you know. Wow. The world was ours. We could do whatever we wanted. Our parents didn't. We could dive off and swim. You know, it was just a wonderful, wonderful childhood. I was too stupid to know that I was anchored down in a small little town and would <laughs> never get out at that time. Because I started school here in the very first grade and I graduated. And at that time, there were 11 grades because the school had not been affiliated till my sister graduated and was the first graduate from this Port Isabel school. Wow. But Valerie, I looked it up the other day after you and I talked and I found out that it went to 12 grades in 1941. Okay. Yeah. So right after you graduated. Right. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to continue on down Garcia Street here and um, Eventually, we're going to take South Shore and then swing over in front of the school. Uh, Bobby, do you remember the first time you took the causeway to South Padre Island? I was not here when it was finished. Uh, Junior and I were on a job out of state. He was in construction business with, with after this after World War II, and of course that was built what in '54. Right. Yeah, we were not here when we came. It was already being built. But uh, I worked with the island. We were in the bait business and I supplied all of the bait shops on the island. So I went across the bridge several times a day and that was awesome. That was awesome. And it was a small town in, in South Pottery Island also. It was not a, a metropolis by any means. So it was just another friendly little town to go visit. It was, it was, it was nice. It was really nice. But, but we sure had a big uh, barrier of, of salt sand out there that buried us every day. Oh, right. Oh, my God, those sandstorms were Nothing awful. to hold it down. Nothing to hold it down. They tried windmills. They tried flooding it. They tried everything. And it was almost impossible. So we're blessed to have outdoor resorts or whatever they call it now. Long Island, Long Island Village. Village. Yeah. Yes, because that is because a, that's they, a spoil they, bank. They, they put some sod down and kept it from blowing but boy after they built the intercoastal canal and dumped all that salt sand up there we ate dust for a long long time right long long time so it was a, a convenient to cross to the island then oh, yeah. uh, using this bridge maybe not as much fun as you had in a boat ah uh, well yeah i grew up and i required more entertainment than i had when i was 10 or 12 years old <laughs> 
<laughs> so we're crossing this old barge right now, which was, this is the original barge that was uh, manufactured for this bridge in 1954. And this would have been the way you go to South Padre Island. Had to go through that little toll booth for a while. Oh yeah. So this is one of the last uh, swing bridges in Texas. I've got it painted up pretty bright right now. I've never seen it this bright. Yeah. It has taken a couple of hits. Uh, some sometime back in the 50s, it was it was struck, and then uh, again after the bridge collapse. Um, had enough damage on it that they had to close the bridge. It's pretty hard to live over here, but it's, it's worth it because the people that live here love it. And it is a beautiful area. And uh, the bridge is inconvenient. It's, it's pretty hard to get in and out. And then people that have health problems and stuff. Yeah, that's true. You know, that it, uh, I had a friend that lived over here and uh, I've had to come over in a boat and pick him up to make his doctor's appointments and stuff like that because the bridge would be open at the time of his appointments and what have you. But, yeah, uh, this intersection is shared between uh, this vehicular traffic and the maritime traffic. Right. Which the maritime traffic at one time was a whole lot more than it is now. Yes. Oh my God, the bridge was swinging open and shut constantly. Constantly. I mean, it hardly got closed. It was time to open it again. We had all those shrimp boats that had to go through. So when you look down there, you see um, this used to be just loaded with shrimp boats yes. and uh, fish houses. Yes. Did you ever think it would look like this? Never. Never. No. It was pretty, pretty busy little, little town. Shrimping capital of the world, right? Because of, of how much shrimp moved through here and our port was busy our port was very very busy we had a lot of activity there even in the 40s and the 50s we had more ships go through here than went through Galveston a lot of times yeah it was an important port uh -huh, uh -huh. so your dad started uh, fishing but did end up um, shrimping you know he never went shrimping well, he shrimped a little bit, but that was in the days that you went out in the morning and you came home at night. You didn't stay out. You usually operated the boat by yourself or just one other person, just a small. And your 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 catch was on the deck when you got to the fish house. You didn't have places to store it and all that. Very small boats. When we did that, I used to stay in the hotel on the island and watch him because he was offshore with his boat shrimping. Mother and I would sit on the porch of the on the hotel on the island and, and watching fish but I think that probably was only one season that he did that then he got into other kind of stuff that he was doing of course in those days you did whatever you could to make right it look, right know? yeah uh, that seems to be a, a truth in coastal towns you have to be uh, a little bit flexible absolutely absolutely he built a lot of docks for mr. Raymond over in the fingers and he, uh, yeah, he was, he was one of those people that could just about tackle anything. Like most of the men in this area, that's all they all did. Good heavens. Uh, they built a town. Yes, definitely. What do you remember of uh, South Shore, the area that we're driving through right now? It, it, uh, it didn't have anything up here at all. This was just a big bunch of clay and the dirt it was nothing there were no houses up here there was nothing back in the early days we just channeled up through here we would come up here to get to the channel but we didn't have any reason to be up here that it, it was um, it was no, no reason to be here fish houses weren't here then as I said they were mostly on North Shore right they weren't over on this side until they built the intercoastal Intercoastal changed a lot of things, didn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, the jetty's uh, construction was happening about the time you got here as My well. My dad did that. He, he, put the, he put what they called a dinghy, one of the machines that took the rocks out and 
put them on the barges to go right to the island yeah yeah I think every male that there were in those days was involved some way in the building of the jetties I know a lot of the old timers that I talked to the old families and stuff that they're talking about their grandfathers working on the jetties at one time right yeah well that was a um that was a, boom to a big there. job yes oh, yeah. right right and um, and changed um, the safety of that Brazos Santiago Pass. Big time. <clears throat> so uh, let's talk a little bit about school days here. So you came when you were seven. You were in first grade. First grade, and my sister was a senior, and she was from Rochester, Minnesota, and she was in the twelfth grade, and they didn't have twelfth grades here. So they didn't quite know what to do with her, but they let her hang around the school and do errands and take care of things and work for the superintendent, put in her senior year there so that she could graduate because she was only legal had she gone to 11th grades, which here would have been the junior that, the, right. you know. So, uh, and then when she and, and uh, Ethel Morgan graduated, they were the first two graduates of the Port Isabel school system. Nobody had ever graduated before her. It took somebody coming all the way from Minnesota to make that yeah, happen. Yeah, really. She even had her class ring and everything. Yeah, she was. I don't think she was a happy camper. She had a boyfriend and she had a job and she liked Rochester. Oh, I, I, I imagine that must have been hard. I don't think our parents gave us any choice. Not to my knowledge. Sometimes you, know, you have to follow the work. I'm surprised she didn't leave because she couldn't. It was a depression. Where could she go? You know? Yeah. So she stayed here and married a local boy and raised her family here. So once you get here, you don't, you can't get out. I think they closed the gate and you can't get out. <laughs> um, Junior Wells' family, where did, where did, his Junior family was born in Lyford, Texas. Oh, really? Yep. And uh, his mother moved to Port Isabel, and she had a restaurant on Garcia Street, and my father had a garage on Garcia Street, so Junior and I were buddies. We were seven years old when we met, and we were together every single day of our life because we went to the same school. We walked together. We played together. We grew up together, and you know, it was just, I thought he was my brother for a long time because we were always together. Yeah. My brother was eight years older than me, so after he had been here a couple of years, he moved on. So I was an only child then, so Junior and I just hit it off really good. And I knew I was going to catch him before, <laughs> before it was all over because he was the only blue-eyed, brown, uh, um, blonde-haired boy in Port Isabel. <clears throat> And I thought he belonged to me. Well, it turned From out it turned out you were right. <laughs> I was right. Yeah. Ups and downs and in and outs, but we hit it off yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So some of your uh, uh, memories from school here included um, being a drummer in the band. I was the snare drummer in the band, and the reason I was a snare drummer is because the school furnished the instruments. I couldn't buy an instrument and be in the band. Good Lord, I didn't have any money. But I loved the drums because my father played drums when he was young. Oh! So he taught me a lot, and uh, yeah, our band was awesome. We did concerts at least every three months we would have a concert and invite the public and we were in the auditorium at the high school and we put on quite a show pretty kept, hot stuff oh yeah kept everybody interested in something to do in port isabel because we didn't have tv and radio and all right. that stuff so it was just awesome that we could put on our little plays in high school junior and senior play and also a little operettas we just helped entertain the town. That was very, very much part of what we did. So we're here across the street from the school, which is the site of a school this community was very, very proud of. I mean, postcards were made to commemorate the construction of um, the school here, which you say was located about down in the playground area yes, here. Yes, it was, uh -huh. definitely. Mm -hmm. 
And the school was just one building, high school, junior, grade school, and everything within one building. Right. We had sometimes two and three classes in one room because we only had four or five people in each class. I graduated with seven people in my high school. And I said my sister graduated with two. <laughs> So this I would say where that building is now is about where it was because we did have a nice kind of, well, no, it's, it's in the playground because the boys used to go across the street to the palm tree so they could smoke a cigarette. Oh, that is telling tales out of school. No, I know, but they were high school kids. Yeah, when we were in high school, we were over here. <coughs> All these years later, Bobby, new new kids coming through here well before we wrap this up is there anything that you'd want to add I know we're gonna we're going to uh, have an opportunity to do more of these but is there anything that you'd like to add no I would just like for people to drive around and see our little town I, I have friends that I meet for lunch and stuff they don't have a clue what's across the street. Drive around. I, I make them get in my car and I take them around yeah. whether they're wanting to go or not. I said, you've got to see the other side of town. You only come down Main Street. Right. Especially if you live in Laguna Vista or the golf course. You come into Port Isabel, hit the causeway and go to the island. And I said, you need to take a little detour. Yeah, there are lots of facets to this town. See how we yeah. live. See why we are who we are and why we're so obstinate sometimes because we don't want it to change because we like and they'll say well why is that house it's almost falling down I said that belongs to somebody and it's very precious to them right I said you don't come in here and rearrange our little city although urban renewal did do that yeah it has been done it screwed up really bad but that's another story but we love our little city and we love our way of life Leave us alone. Enjoy it. <laughs> come and share it with us, but don't come and try to make it over. Right. That's my last opinion for now. Well, I, I hope we're going to continue this, Bobby. I thank you so much today for hanging out with me and sharing your history, and we'll look forward to talking more about Port Isabel history. And thanks, everybody, for watching.